Christian Confronted with Tough Questions by Braxton Hunter, who's well known from his Braxton Hunter 10 questions that 50 million atheists have answered. But this was, this this caught my eye because it said a Christian, and the Christian in, involved here is Michael Jones of Inspiring Philosophy. He was confronted with tough Bum, 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 question. So let's see what kind of tough questions Christians think are tough. Be prepared to be sadly disappointed. You mock my pain. Life is pain, Highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. Tucker Carlson on Joe Rogan recently argued that UFOs were bad supernatural beings, demons, and even implied that it was obvious. And that there's good reason to believe that they are working with the U.S. government as such. What do you make out of the high-profile claims about UFOs and like these uh, these pilots that are claiming they see it and stuff like that? What what is it? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's it's hard to say what's going on because we don't have all the information. We can't be making these kinds of um. All right, Braxton, brother, I'd like you to get a dictionary or go online. And type in the word confronted and then understand why this is so disappointing. How are you confronting? Now, confronting Michael Jones about UFOs is impossible unless Michael Jones, say, works for the government. Like if Michael Jones worked for the CIA or he worked for the State Department and you knew that he had some information that he was maybe covering up, then you could confront him about UFOs. But he isn't, nor nor is this likely an issue. So this isn't even really a tough question either. It's mostly just a bunch of baseless conjecture. Tucker Carlson, if he said those things, is obviously just playing to the crowd for, you know, whatever, for an audience, or he's an idiot, one of the two. He's probably just an entertainer. These things are real. They're apparently <laughs> not of human origin and can defy physics. Theories about UFOs are actually true. I met him, he's a moron. He's a moron. He is. He's a moron! Thank you, come again. There's no credible evidence that UFOs have vid visited Earth and have some deal going on with the U.S. government. Is it possible? Well, sure. To quote Sean Carroll, the answer is always yes, it's possible. Because they know from my AMA episodes that if you ever start a question by asking, do you think it's possible that? The answer is going to be yes. <laughs> <laughs> that might not be the answer that you care about, but it's possible, sure, as long as you're not, you know, adding two even numbers together and getting an odd number. Is it plausible? Not likely. To have a conspiracy at that level is kind of insane. So anyways, we're off to a bad start, Brecht, and I came to this video looking for some tough questions that were confrontational, that were tough. Like things that Michael Jones would be put on the hot seat to answer. The hot seat? The kilowatt couch? Because nothing he says here, I mean, I guess he could have said, yeah, I believe in UFOs or demons, and then he would look silly. But other than saying that, which he's obviously too smart to say something that stupid, then all, you know, no answer he can give is going to be satisfying. Like, so what what he thinks? His opinion's meaningless because he's not in the, you know, he doesn't have ties to government. And there you go. That, that was a waste of time, dude, really. You sold a reverberating carbonizer with mutate capacity to an unlicensed cephalopoid. Jeeves, you piece of... All right. Uh, so recently I reacted to this atheist creator named Mindship. It's an impossible thing to conceptualize, but there are some visualizations and some kind of thought experiments that one can do to help get them further down the road. And the further down the road you go towards the concept of infinity, the more you realize there's no good version of it. There can't be. Nothing can go on forever and be a good version. Of two made a video about heaven and he was pointing out the problem of eternal boredom in heaven that and this was pictured at the end of the show the good place i don't know if you ever saw that spoiler alert mm -hmm. oh my oh my look at that oh thank you thank you so very very much but um you know it's like it, eventually you'll have done everything you'll have had every interesting conversation you'll have uh gone every place a trillion times over and at some point doesn't that just naturally doesn't have to result in uh some sort of just uh eternal boredom 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of problems with, with this. For one, I think when you take that approach, you're taking a selfish approach to the way experiences are supposed to work. All right, I don't see how this question is tough or confrontational. It's an interesting question. I watched that video by Brandon. I even commented on it, and I even pushed back on Brandon. I don't exactly agree with his – With, I think we're too limited to know, so who knows. I once – I once, back in, back in the day when I was writing lit RPG for a short time in my short-lived novelist career, um, I, I kind of had an outline and idea for a book. It, it was along these lines. Earth is a video game. And just like the Mormons believe, like you don't come to Earth without consent, and other people believe this too, like your soul exists out here. You actually consent to come to Earth. And in this this novel idea I had, you would... You would get points by playing terrible characters. So it's like if you wanted to play somebody cool like a movie star, you would have to be like a janitor and a plumber and a slave and somebody who's abused. Like you'd have to you'd have to be put in all these terrible roles. Like you're gonna go be born to a, a poor single fourteen year old mother in the nineteen forties uh, South, and you're gonna just gonna have to struggle with that. And however the game plays out, you get you know, you get, you get, you work up XP points. Eventually you have enough in the bank and you can come back to earth and play somebody cool. Now, of course, is that possible? May I refer back to Sean Carroll? Yeah, sure. Any of these, any of these conjectures are, are, you know, they're not plausible, but they're certainly in the realm of possibility. I happen to be a fan of hard science fiction by a guy named Greg Egan. He's got a book called Permutation City. If you're interested in this concept in Permutation City, this ever-expanding, self-replicating universe, which contains the uh, essentially like the souls or the personalities of a select rich group that were able to fund this project, can live for eternity in this ever-expanding universe that can, goes on and on and on. And, and in this, though, they can program themselves to slow down time. They can put themselves into sleep. So one of the things they can do and that they did do is they created another like uh, self-replicating of cells in an autoverse and then they let it run for like a billion years and then checked in on it again so they could like let that run at a billion years on their time it's maybe a year goes by and they're like check check on the autoverse and in the autoverse these these beings end up becoming sentient and they figure out evolution's true but the twist is it their universe got started by essentially a god, you know, the human being that created the autoverse. Anyways, it creates a lot of cool drama. There's a character in, in this book who spends his time climbing cliffs for, you know, 100,000 years. He'll climb up or down the same cliff face. Uh, or he'll, he has the thing programmed, so when he gets bored, he stops. So one of the things he does is he makes um, table legs on a lathe. Now, if you've ever used a lathe, then the, the only time I've used a lathe is making homemade pins where you lathe, like, the resin, resin and plastic super like therapeutic and mesmerizing I mean, you're the thing spinning real fast and you're like grinding off pieces you could do it for hours and your mind just goes so in the book this guy makes table legs on a lathe for like a hundred thousand years and then he gets bored and he goes does something else so so while i do understand brandon's point and he's probably right that it would eventually you would, unless your mind so here's the thing and even in even in one of the answers either braxton or michael jones says is Oh, well, maybe God just erases your brain and then you start over. Well, yeah, if that's the case, but that's a cheat. Like, yeah, if your brain gets erased and you're starting from scratch, you know, you could live infinite number of lives if they're all like 100 years or 70 years or, you know. Oh, what? An entire afternoon at Blips and Chips! Oh, this place is the best. Like, anyways, this question isn't really tough. It's very fascinating, sure, but it's not a tough question because nobody knows the answer. And it's certainly not confrontational, Braxton. Sorry. Next. Yeah, that's the difference between you and me, Morty. I never go back to the carpet store. Um, what's the most mind-blowing thing that you have learned in your studies in the Pentateuch? Uh, particularly, I think you've gone, you've been in Genesis and Exodus over the past couple of years. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of learning involved. I know you do a lot of preparation. Is there something that you found that just uh, above, it kind of stands out more than the most is just kind of, a mind-blowing thing you discovered. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things I, I've discovered. I think may, uh, seeing how Michael Heiser was able to make a case that the serpent is actually Satan is was really intriguing when I studied that. 
Yeah, and you're making fun of Tucker Carlson for thinking that UFOs are demons. You you really think that Genesis was literal a literal story? The people that wrote Genesis weren't even making making it to be a literal story. Nobody thinks that except fundamentalists who, you know, I guess will believe anything. But never mind that. How is this a tough question? Braxton, how is this a tough question? How is it a tough question to ask him what's the most mind-blowing thing when he when he studied? This, this is like saying, I got a really confrontational, tough question for you, dude. When the last time that you went out for pizza, what toppings did you put on it? And are those your favorite? Or... I got a tough question for you, dude. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Now that'll put you on the hot seat. Come on. I tuned into this for some tough questions, not his, you know, subjective opinion on what blew his mind most. You want to know what blew my mind most when, when I was doing some studying? Was finding out that Yahweh also demanded child sacrifice. That was mind-blowing to me because even as an atheist, I didn't think that was possible until a bunch of scholars pointed it out and I read it for myself. Now that was mind blowing. Of course, you guys don't want to you guys don't want to touch that those kind of topics because you'd rather talk about how the the talking snake was really the devil. Seriously? Go ask a Jewish rabbi if that's the interpretation of the Hebrew. Or is Michael Jones more He's more qualified to understand the Hebrew text than than all the Jews that ever existed. Jew, 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 Jew. Oh, the Jews. <laughs> Come on, Braxton, you can do better than this. And I'd also like to point out it's anti-Semitic. When Michael Jones basically trashes all the Jewish tradition, all the Jewish history, all the Jewish knowledge, it's like a bizarre, evil cultural appropriation where he's saying no. All you Jews are stupid. The snake was really sa the Christian Satan. Do you see how that's anti-Semitic? It's racist, and it's it's and it's just stupidity. But of course, Braxton Hunter's got his good Christian buddy on. So the idea of confrontation and tough questions it, that was a, that you were selling a bill of goods, dude. And who could it have been? Let me think. Let me knock on Mr. Noggin. <laughs> Satan. John MacArthur recently said the major noble lie is there is such a thing as mental illness. Now, this isn't new, and he said some more things, but he said there's no such thing as PTSD. There's no such thing as OCD. There's no such thing as ADHD. Those are noble lies to basically give the excuse to, at the end of the day, to medicate people. And the big pharma is in charge of a lot of that. Do you have any kind of off-the-cuff reaction to those comments? Yeah, clearly his children are like, it's time for you to take your medication, Grandpa. And he's like, these medications are of the devil. I think that's what happened. Let's be honest right now. He doesn't want to keep taking those pills. Yeah, the, the rest, the rest of this is fake news, I guess. I was blown away by how stupid it was, to be honest. I mean, now Michael Jones is one of the most arrogant, condescending, self-righteous blowhards in this apologist space. Like, like. He never seems happy for one. He's he's he just seems like a miserable human being. I don't I don't mean that in a way that that I'm calling him a miserable human being and that he's bad. I'm calling it as a miserable human being in his own presence for himself. Like he's just got to be a miserable human being meaning he's got an empty sad life. Now Braxton here build this as tough questions and confrontational questions for a Christian. So the so the tough question, Braxton, let me give you a little clue on if you're going to be honest, if you're going to be an honest, you know, in your thumbnails and your description and you're going to and and you're going to provide value. Would you wouldn't laugh along with Michael Jones, oh ha ha, you know, John MacArthur is a freaking idiot and he's real stupid and he's old and he should quit preaching because he's a dummy. Like, yeah, you know, I tend to I tend to agree with you. John MacArthur is a bigot, a racist. He's wrong. He's an evil person. He teaches lies. But, but I'm glad to hear you, Braxton and Michael Jones, bash Christians. I love it when you guys bash other Christians because it just proves my point. You can read John 17, the upper room prayer, where Jesus prayed for unity. God ignored that prayer of Jesus, proving that Jesus was not sent by the Father. We can know this for a fact out of Jesus' own mouth, assuming 
John wrote anything that's true. John mostly made stuff up, so who knows? But if Jesus actually said that, we know he's not from God. Why? Because Jesus asked the Father to make the church unified, like I am unified with you, Father. That was Jesus' prayer. You can go read it yourself. And the church is not unified, and I got, I got Brax, <clears throat> Braxton and Michael here mocking John MacArthur, making fun of him in public. Is that Christian? Well, they, maybe they say he's not a Christian because he's a Calvinist. I don't know. But, and, and look, it's my job as an atheist skeptic to make fun of guys like John MacArthur. You all Christians, when you do it, you just trash Jesus. You know, you just, you just prove to us skeptics that it's all a bunch of BS and we don't need to listen to any of you. Because John MacArthur feels he has the Holy Spirit. John MacArthur feels he's got a good grasp of the Bible, at least as well as Michael Jones. And... If you all say, oh, we have the Holy Spirit, and John MacArthur saying, oh, I have the Holy Spirit, how, how the, should the world judge that? Because you guys are saying different things. Now, I agree that this idea that, you know, medication, it, they should be not used, and that these that various mental problems are all, you know, psychosomatic or caused by demons or, wh or whatever stupid theory um, John MacArthur has. So, like, I'm on board with you. So, if anybody out there listening, if you're a Christian... Um, and you have problems that that are something that medicine can help, like seek help. Go to a doctor or a psychiatrist or a therapist or, you know, whatever. So I, I, I'm not disagreeing with Michael Jones and, and Braxton on this thing. But, again, this is not, Braxton, this is not tough questions in confronting Michael Jones. The tough question to Michael Jones would be, hey, Michael Jones... How is it that you and I, this would be Braxton speaking, how is it that you and I who feel we have the Holy Spirit and we have a pretty good grasp of the Bible, how is it that we are any in a different category than guys like John MacArthur who's been studying the Bible his whole life, he's an old man, he's, he's got wisdom, he's loved and adored by millions of people, I'm assuming, or at least hundreds of thousands. I mean, he's a big dude in, in, in the world that, of, where people respect that kind of teaching, right? So... So are all those people deceived? Um, this is a serious question, Braxter, and this is a tough question, and this is a confrontational question. So you're mocking John MacArthur, and you think he's an old fool who needs to step down. All the people that support him, I'm assuming you also think they're fools, right? Because if you support a fool, if you give money to a fool, and you go to church every Sunday to listen to a fool, you must also be a fool. So you're calling all the Christians that listen to his program online, all the people that follow him on YouTube, all the people, you know, the people that love and support John MacArthur, they're fools. And they're not hearing the Holy Spirit because obviously if the Holy Spirit's true, the Holy Spirit ought to tell these people, hey, you're listening to a fool. Go to a different church and John MacArthur's church should shut down tomorrow. So obviously these people are either, either they're not fools and John MacArthur's really smart and, and Braxton, that means you and Michael Jones are the ones doing evil here and you're wrong. Or like God's not talking to those people and they're deceived. Voila. So we have two camps. We have the Michael Jones, Braxton, Hunter camp, and we have the John MacArthur camp. And you both, both camps say the other people are foolish and wrong. But they both say that they have the Holy Spirit. Why should I trust you, Braxton, over them? And you could put in any other group here, whether it's Council of Trent or Joel Olstein or, uh, you know, Alan Parr and Mike Winger, just throw them all in there and say, okay, why should I, who should I trust? The majority, the majority rule here, when you're all telling me you got the Holy Spirit and you're all telling me you have a good grasp of the Bible and you all disagree, I have a right to say it's obviously all BS. It's obviously all deception. You're all deluding yourself. And if you disagree with me, Braxton, that means you're claiming special pleading, that you're better, that you're a better person than John MacArthur, that you're smarter than John MacArthur, that you have the Holy Spirit better than John MacArthur. In fact, you probably think John MacArthur's not even saved. And if you do think that he's saved, why doesn't he have the Holy Spirit telling him, yo, John, this is, this is a bad teaching. You know, my people need medication because I don't actually heal anybody. I, they need meds. Either way, you lose, dude. And it's just funny that you can sit here and laugh at John MacArthur with Michael and not see the bizarre irony here. And, and as a Christian, how degrading, how you degrade this man. Yeah, even, look, I don't, res I don't have any respect for, for John MacArthur, but I'm an atheist. That, that's to be expected. And 
when you're in the same camp with somebody and then you stab them in the back, then, then you're saying you're not in the same camp. So there you go. So this is just more proof that none of, the, none of you got, you're just all teaching man's wisdom, man's philosophy, your own, your own deluded mind telling you what, that God loves you. God loves Braxton, but God don't love John MacArthur because he's obviously just let him make a fool of himself. So you debated a Muslim sometime back, Daniel Hakikachu, who found himself oh, no. arguing, and I'm going to say this in coded language, that very young children be married and all that typically goes along with that if they had experienced what is called precocious puberty, which is early onset puberty, and showed signs of fertility. Now, this means what you think it means if you didn't hear about this debate. He's arguing that you can marry and do what married people do, what mommies and daddies do. Now, decent people would argue that children can't give consent. Um, but here's something I would like I would like to ask you. Obviously, this is people said on the video, this is like the most disgusting and evil thing ever. And obviously, we agree with that. But uh, what would you say to someone who says something like, um, well, look, you Christians, many of you have an age of accountability doctrine where you think, you know, young children are not accountable for the decisions that they make. But at some point, God does start looking at that sin uh, and, and holding that against you that this there's um, that, that you're you're culpable for your sin in a, a certain way. So we don't normally put that age at 18. Doesn't that kind of mitigate against the notion that you can't give consent until you're 18 um, to kind of make Daniel's case for him? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, because there are different layers of growing up. I mean, growing up doesn't happen instantly. Uh, we recognize that as parents. Like, I'm not going to let my uh, eight-year-old drive, even though I think it, she's now old enough to clean her room and start doing things. We, we start to give little bits here and there as they mature in age. And at some point, God is aware of certain sins that a child could be aware of, and they could freely decide between right and wrong. Okay, Braxton finally gets a tough question, but he doesn't really confront Michael Jones on the answer, and he, they don't really get to the heart of the answer. And his question's kind of conv convoluted and doesn't really... I, I'm going to try to put into words what I think the real question here is, and it's, and it's as follows. Michael Jones and others uh, criticize this idea of the child brides or young women getting married in Islam, and... Braxton is saying, yeah, okay, but you have this age of accountability in Christendom, and it's under 18, so what gives? So the heart of the question is, and, and this, is, this, is, this is, I don't think that Braxton made this point clear to Michael Jones. It certainly didn't seem like he answered it to me. I'll link to their interview in, in the notes, and you can go see for yourself. But here's the question. The question is, Christians believe there's an age of accountability i.e. God sends somebody to hell if they haven't converted after a certain age. So Christians will generally say, well, yeah, God doesn't send little baby two-year-olds to hell. That would be mean. And three and four is five. That's okay. But around six, seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there, you're starting to know the difference between right and wrong. So whatever your date is, doesn't matter if it's nine or ten or 13, or after your bar mitzvah, or your quinceanera, or your whatever, or, or even if it's 18, right? Here's the point. God sends those people to hell. In other words, God judges them worthy and mature enough to be punished in hell. And so the problem is Christians are saying, and Christians are pretty, like they're, they're pretty adamant about this, that young teens are too young to have sex. They're not mature enough to have sex. Now, there may be some debate about whether the age of consent should be 17, 18, or 19, or, or whatever. It doesn't matter. What matters is Christians believe that teenagers at some point are immature to have sex, and that at some point they're mature enough that the law will say, okay, you can, now you're, you can consent. You're old enough to consent. But at the same time, they think the same teenager is mature enough to be sent to hell. So think about that. Two 17-year-olds are going to prom, and the, the parents say, you guys are not mature enough to have sex. You're only 17. And the pa youth pastors say, you're only 17. You're not married. You're not mature enough. Your brain's not mature enough to have sexual intercourse at 17. You're not mature enough. 
You're not, you can't consent legally. You're immature. These two kids go to prom, get in a car rash. Not even their fault. Somebody hits, a drunk driver hits them. They're completely innocent. They're seat belted in. They're driving the speed limit. Bam. Well, it turns out that one, one of them, one of them wasn't truly saved yet. So they get to heaven and then let's just make it the girl. She's, she's the one that wasn't truly saved. And the guy's like, hey, is my friend okay? And, you know, St. Peter says, oh, she's in hell. She, she reached the age of consent and we sent her to hell because she wasn't saved. But you're saved. Welcome to heaven. Woohoo! You made it. Woo. And he's like, well, what about, oh, don't worry. God has a program for that. We're going to either erase your mind, your memories of that girl that you loved, or we're going to make you happy. She's in hell. Woohoo! Isn't that cool? Save me, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, save me. Um, what are the most central beliefs you have that support Christianity that if they were debunked, you could no longer call yourself a Christian? So for me, primarily the resurrection, but I always say that God exists and God raised Jesus from the dead. If God exists and God raised Jesus from the dead, something like Christianity, some kind of Christianity seems to me to be the best explanation. Um, what about you? Are there other things you would list or do you think those that's probably right? I mean, if there was a way to really debunk the Trinity, I might add that in there. Yeah, because uh, I'm I'm thoroughly convinced the Bible teaches that. I, I don't think you can. I don't think a Unitarian reading of the Bible makes any sense whatsoever. Uh, so there's that. But I think the resurrection is going to be the key thing. Also, if the Gospels are unreliable, like let's say we found new evidence and we just agreed they all dated to like the like the time of Nicaea. Like I Look, the Gospels are not reliable except to Christians. So you, you're a Christian before you believe the Gospels are reliable. I have not yet found anyone that found the Gospels reliable as a scholar, historian, and then became saved because they're so reliable. So that... And how is this a tough question or even a confrontational question? It's like saying, well, like, what would you give up being an atheist for well if you prove there is a god it wouldn't even matter which one or could be lots of gods i couldn't be an atheist if there was good evidence that a god exists and if there was good evidence that if there was good evidence that the gospels were unreliable and the resurrection didn't happen you would all still be christians because you believe it you believe like you believe it it doesn't matter what the evidence is i don't know i don't get this thing with evidence Anyways, this is, seems like a throwaway question. It's like, oh, yeah, well, if they dug up Jesus' bones. And what is the most underrated book? And maybe it's a commentary like uh, on some book of the Bible, or maybe it's just uh, some book like Heiser or Walton that gives a different view of creation, or maybe, uh, I, I don't know. What is the most important book or most underrated book, I, I would say, that uh, thoughtful Christians should read? murmuring against moses i'd say oh uh, how's that a tough question braxton how is that confrontational how they, it, i mean sure this might be an interesting question it might be interesting like what books you know i don't know if 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 michael jones put you know like the top 10 books i think thoughtful christians should read that would be interesting to christians but it's certainly not a tough question or is it controversial or put them in the hot seat i don't get it as far as murmuring for Moses, come on, dude. You guys need to grow up. Moses was a fictional character. This is what scholarship knows. This, 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 this. Come on. It, it, go watch Satan's Guide to the Bible. Avio, Moses is a literary character. He was written as a literary character. He is a literary character. He didn't write all that stuff. It was, And also it was redacted. There's like... Oh gosh, I can't remember that. There's like four different groups: the Jehovahists, the 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 priests. Um, I don't know. I'm not an Old Testament guy, so I don't know. Go look up this on your own. But the, these books were redacted over many hundreds of years. Moses was not the author. The 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 whole thing with the Exodus. Come on, do we still have to talk about this like it's real? Can you guys really, can you join us in 2024, please? And if, you, and if you're going to ask tough and quote, you know, con, 
controversial or confrontational questions, that would be one of them. <clears throat> why is it that why is it that you still believe in Moses when all the people that you know that study this actually for a living, who are very smart, much smarter than you and know the languages and studied the books, they all they all say the evidence shows Moses was was not a real person and the Exodus didn't happen. Like you gotta have some pretty strong evidence to overcome that. You don't. So if you just want to say, I believe it on faith, like you believe the the talking snake, well, okay, fine. But then why do you why read books? Honestly, Michael, why would you need to read a book? Like you already believe it. What's the point of reading a book for evidence? Because you don't care what the evidence shows, obviously. It's just sad, actually. So I thought a question. I have a hard time, and I don't know what this says about me or about you. But I have a hard time imagining you sitting there enjoying a sermon on a Sunday morning because I just imagine that you're critiquing everything the guy's saying in your head. Uh, well, here's the thing. Here's what I'll say about that uh, before you move on. Yeah. I do that a lot at churches for sure. And then I, I'm in my current church and I really like my pastor. Like, I think he's a great preacher. Like, so like, it's very rare you go to a church and the pastor's like, and so St. Augustine wanted, made this comment. And it reminded me of something that Clement of Alexandria's. And I was like, yeah, this is where this is perfect. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's very intellectual. All right. I kind of clipped the whole question because because there was a lot of banter in there. But, but Braxton's basically asking what what what's like the ideal pastor for you? Now, as far as I know, Michael Jones won't go on record of saying where he goes to church or what kind of church because he doesn't want the flack that he'll get from that. But it doesn't matter. He goes to a specific church that believes a whole bunch of other specific churches are people that are deceived, wrong, going to hell. Doesn't matter what church he's at, that's axiomatically the position they take, that the other guy's wrong. Now, as I said before, Michael Jones is one of the most arrogant, self-righteous, self-righteous, and, and just he has this air of superiority. So listen to what he says about how much he loves his pastor because it's so intellectual. And notice what he says. Almost no churches have this kind of smart pastor. Basically, what he's saying is most of you all go to churches with dummies for pastors who don't know their stuff, and it's a, and it's this attitude that I, I Michael Jones, I value intellect, and I go to a church with a good smart pastor who can quote from Clement and Augustine. Woohoo! I'm gonna get into heaven. Woohoo! It's like the commercial. I'm getting a Dell. Dude, you're getting a Dell. Dude, you're getting a Dell. Yeah, I know that makes I'm not a boomer, but close. Um Oh Lord, I don't even know what to say to this. It's just it's just sad. So if God's real, if God if the Christian God is real, then the then Michael Jones has to believe that the Christian God gave him something special and denied it the rest of the people. Now, when you listen to these guys talk when they bash on Calvinists, they say, oh, well, that Calvinist is ugly and Calvinist. Dude, you're no different from a Calvinist because those other people aren't smart like you, Michael Jones. So they, how are they going to get saved? They don't know that the Mormon church they go to or the 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 you know, holy roller pentecostal church they go to because they don't have the same brains that god gave you i don't know braxton you tell me that this is the tough question how can god be just when he gives michael jones this amazing intellect this amazing ability that michael jones is so much smarter than the rest of us and then he gets rewarded for it and people like me cuz i'm obviously you know, totally stupid because I can't see the, the amazing evidence of Christianity. I'm blind to it. All right, so I get to go to hell for that. And this is justice to you. That's the tough question. Now, this is a very important one. Uh, it could be controversial. Can you steal man? I'm going to ask you to steal man. I I'm going to ask you to steal man a case that you're going to create. <laughs> Can you steal man a case that Game of Thrones is better than Lord of the Rings. Oh. Yeah, of course Michael Jones is going to like Lord of the Rings better because it's a fantasy that's written by a Christian and it's got these black and white, light and dark, obvious, this is evil, this is good, blah, 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 blah. Now, this isn't a tough question. 
and it, it doesn't confront him in any way. Now, he does give a pretty good answer. If you want to listen to it, again, the link's in. I'll put in the, the link to the original show. And he does give George R. R. Martin credit for creating complex characters, and he is right because he, he gives the example of Jamie Lannister who who can be somebody that you like you despise but then root for. And the same can be said um, at least in at least in the in the series. I'm trying to remember if it's the same. I don't know if they've got there yet with or if they changed it. I, it's been a little bit too much time but but in the series when, when Cersei, so it's like Cersei's this horrible monster, but when the church gets a hold of her, all of a sudden you're rooting for her because the most evil, vile villain is never as evil as the church. So this would be a lot why a guy like Michael Jones would be a little uncomfortable praising Game of Thrones because George R. 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 Martin shows it like it is. Are atheists smarter on average than religious people? Uh, yes, uh, according to the most recent data I found. Now it's like, only a few IQ points. Yeah, this isn't a tough question, and it doesn't confront him in any way. And you know, what's he going to say? He just the data is the data. Now we we all agree that intelligence in and of itself is not an indicator of whether people will believe nonsense or not, because there are PhDs and very 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 intelligent people that believe every different thing. There's Mormons and Muslims. And there's Hindus and there's Christians of all stripes that disagree with each other, whether it's Calvinist or Armenians or Orthodox or Catholics or whatever. Like, there's tons of people in all these groups that are very smart. But that goes back to the point I've been trying to make, and I think I've made it well, but I'll make it again. Why should we listen to any of you all when you guys are all groups that represent a bell curve of, you know, from not so smart to really genius, and you all say the same stuff. We have the holy book that's true and the right interpretation of the holy book, and we've talked to God, and God's confirmed we're right. I've had a burning in my bosom, or all has told me, or Krishna's come and visited me, or Jesus has told me. It's all the same story. Why should anyone take anybody's claims as important? It's not. Now, the, it is telling... That when you get into some of the hard sciences like cosmology, quantum mechanics, physics, chemistry, and those things, that those those types of those groupings tend to have a, high, a much higher percentage of atheists in them. And so, why is that? Well, it seems to be that people that give up superstition and give up beliefs from the Stone Age and the Bronze Age, they want to know how the world works, and they're curious, and they and they tend to lean towards the science, the sciences. So uh, I'm not saying there aren't smart Christians in the sciences. What I'm saying is, the the hard sciences, the hard sciences have more atheists. I think simply for that fact, they're they're drawn to that because why? They actually care about truth, and they're actually they're following their inquiries where they lead. Now I know you'll say if you're a Christian, oh well, we Christians care about the truth. No, BS. You don't care about the truth because if you cared about the truth, you wouldn't have your conclusion at the start of your path. You would be like the scientist and you'd go use good methodology. If you use good methodology and you don't and you strip the biases away, you can't stay a Christian. It's impossible. You can only stay a Christian if you cling to the indoctrination or the emotion or the bias, or you're afraid of hell, or it's just built into your mind. Of course there's a God, and of course it's Jesus. Of course. Of course those billions of people that believe all those false gods, of course they're wrong, and woohoo, God loves me. Dude, you're getting Adele. Let's be serious. Dude, you're getting Adele. Hey. If God commanded you, if you became convinced God commanded you to sacrifice your child like he commanded of Abraham, and we know that God stepped in and stopped in the whole thing and the, uh, provided a sacrifice, but if that, it, but he, he seemed willing, if you were put in that same position, would you do it? And if the answer is uh, no, then does that mean you don't really trust your God? And if the answer is yes, then doesn't that show that people shouldn't be involved in religion because just look what someone could convince themselves they should do? Well, I mean, the the second question is just assuming that religion is just delusional. I mean, like, or, I mean, you're just assuming the conclusion you want. We got to actually look at it from from an internal critique, like that God actually does exist and He does show up and He does say this. 
Testing, one, two, three. Okay, this question and this answer reveals some, some really, it's, it's, it's almost bizarre. It's like we're in a twilight zone. The Michael Jones, Michael Jones is saying, oh, well, you're assuming in the beginning that, that religion, you know, like leads to delusion or, or people are deluded in religion. And dude, that's what Michael Jones thinks about at least 85 to 95 percent of the human population on this earth that they're deluded and their religion is wrong and they got the wrong god or they have the right name say jehovah or jesus but they worship it in a, in a way that's faulty like like unitarian or you know in a in what he would consider a cult and i was wondering why this sounded so weird there now, that is actually going to provide a good example here. That sometimes, that sometimes we, we're not aware of our environment. Like I just forgot I had my headphones on. And something seems strange to me. And I'm like, what is, what's strange? And I realized, oh, no wonder. I've still got this stupid headset on. But most of the time in life, we don't recognize our, we're, we're like, we're like fish in water in that we, we don't recognize the water. So Michael Jones is a white American who grew up in a culture that's very conducive to becoming a Christian. I don't know his whole backstory, but most Christians aren't Muslims or Hindus for a reason. And so for Michael Jones to say, oh, well, you're starting with the conclusion that, that religious belief and religion is, is a delusion— that's the starting point he starts with. We all start with that because it's obvious. Religion makes people do and say dumb things and often very dangerous things. This is axiomatic, and I can't believe that he's even trying to argue that's not the case because he thinks all Muslims and Hindus are deluded, right? He even thinks John MacArthur, whose beliefs are very similar to Michael Jones, is deluded. Like their belief system, I mean, I understand that Michael Jones and Braxton um, can can reject part of the denomination or Calvinism or whatnot, but the but the core beliefs that they hold are very similar, and they're and they're obviously rejecting the Jews and blah blah blah. So so what is this thing that that religion doesn't make you deluded and do stupid things and quite often dangerous things? Now back to the part about this these being tough questions. That that question shouldn't be tough. The answer should be F no. I would never kill one of my kids under any circumstances. That's the answer I would give. I don't care if the god of the universe shows up. I don't care if Everybody in America votes. I don't care if the entire world tells me to kill one of my kids. I am not killing one of my kids. If Jesus showed up and told me to kill one of my kids, I'd tell him, dude, get out of my room or get out of my, get out, get out of my brain. That's what a rational person would do. And then if I, I'd probably go seek help. If I really thought God was telling me to kill one of my kids, I would go and seek psychiatric help at least a therapist, maybe a doctor, I don't know. I, I want to know what was wrong with me. So that should have been the first thing that came out of Michael Jones' mouth as an answer. And the very first thing he should, have be, he should have said is, I would never kill one of my kids, and if I ever felt I was being told to kill one of my kids, I would immediately seek mental um, health care. I would, I would tell somebody I trust to take me to the doctor right away. Now, who is it that hears voices to tell them to go kill somebody? Well, we know, right? We, we, we know that that's a mental, it, it, it's a mental disease. And here's the funny thing. So a paranoid schizophrenic who hears voices and does stupid things, and I'm, I'm about to go choke silly dog. Um, no, not really. I love silly dog. So... All right, I think I think silly dog will be better if I just hold him for a minute. Now, sil, sil, silly dog has some kind of neurological damage. He's he's my favorite dog, and he's a good boy, aren't you, silly dog? And back to the medicine thing. So so these guys and the other question about the medicine say, look, 
MacArthur is crazy for saying don't be on meds because medicine's real because our brains are organic machines. So they acknowledge that. They acknowledge that our brains, our thoughts work on an organic computer, essentially. And so when somebody is told to go kill a child or do something crazy because they have a mental, some sort of incapacity, it's weird in a couple ways because, first of all, these guys think somebody like that should still be sent to hell, I'm assuming, because they rejected Jesus, unless they're making an exception for that, but then they're not going to make an exception for like the 14 or 15 or 16-year-old who's reached the age of accountability. Those are the kind of tough questions, Braxton, if you're going to talk to somebody and confront them and ask tough questions, those, are the, those would be the trails to go down, actually really tough questions. And I know why you don't want to do that. Because it's uncomfortable. You don't, you don't want to make this guy feel he's on your show, you're live streaming, you want to be a nice host. You don't want to ask the tough questions. I get it. But don't pretend. Don't pretend like you guys are seeking truth here. You're just having a friendly conversation. If, if, if Michael Jones would actually seriously consider sacrificing one of his own kids, and I don't think that he would. I think he's just playing to the crowd here. But if he really would, then he needs help. There's something mentally wrong with him. There's something, like, I guess if I was a Christian, my answer to this would be, Braxton, if I felt a voice telling me to go kill my kid, I would say, I know that Jesus already provided the final sacrifice, so get behind me, Satan. I will not listen to you, Satan, get, and I rebuke you. Because no, because God wouldn't, God already has the perfect sacrifice in Jesus. So anybody telling me to kill my kid, ha, to kill my kid has to be a devil. Now I don't believe in devils and demons and Satan and all that stuff. So if that if that happened to me now, like if I heard a voice, I would just I would probably think I was dreaming. If I wasn't dreaming and I was getting that, I would think, okay, I'm suffering from something like paranoid schizophrenia or some other mental disease, and I would seek help. And I suggest, Michael Jones, if you ever feel like you should kill one of your kids, you go seek help because that's a sick thought to have and not get help. Get help. And the answer to that question is, I would never kill my, one of my kids, and I would go get help right away. That's the only answer. Anything other than that is just a bunch of... It, 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 it just shows how... It just shows the depravity of your own religion. Yeah. Where's the Garden of Eden? It's right here, baby, in this house. <laughs> well, that's not a tough question. You can't confront him on it. It's just a bunch of conjecture about where the Garden of Eden is, which, guess what? It doesn't exist. It never existed. Those were metaphors and allegories and stories. Come on. Do we have to talk about this again? Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, okay, well, where's the Ark of the Covenant? Uh, is it in a warehouse somewhere at Area 51 where Har Harrison Ford placed it? it? No, it's Indiana Jones. And that is actually my great grandfather. Henry, Henry Jones Jr., yes. Henry Jones, yes. Okay, so I'm a direct descendant. <laughs> All right, that's not a tough question either. At least in this case, there's no implausibility that there actually was an Ark of the Covenant at some time, although what it actually had in it wouldn't be like these tablets from Moses and manna because those are pretend things and Aaron's staff that can still sprout that that's also a pretend thing. So the Ark of the Covenant might be completely pretend. Again, I'm not an expert in the Old Testament I don't, and I haven't read experts enough to know if there's some thought the Ark of the Covenant is actually a real thing. It could be, I guess, the, the, the container maybe had some scrolls and gold in it i don't know anyway so michael's answer is yeah it probably you know and got carted off to babylon and melted down for its gold or whatever this isn't a tough question and it's nothing you can confront him on this is the kind of question you would ask somebody that's actually has a phd in many years of study in archaeology or you know in those kind of artifacts or possibly in old testament studies where you know that with a crossover into archaeology or something like that so michael jones's answer on this is it's kind of pointless anyways because he's not an expert in that field and it's certainly not a tough question it's certainly not something you can quote confront him on so i feel cheated with that one too and anyways we're at the end here just in case you're wondering again i'll put the clip or not the clip but the the whole original show the live stream in the notes so you can listen to it if you want 
keep in mind, I cut out all the questions from like super chats and, and the audience because that's, you know, maybe they ask tough questions. I, I don't know. I didn't pay attention. I came to watch this thing because Braxton advertised it as tough questions for a Christian and that he was going to be confronting the guy and he didn't confront him on anything. None of the questions were very tough. A few were tough, but Braxton's not good at or didn't want to follow up with the tough follow-ups and, and nail down Michael Jones in the places where there's either paradoxes or unanswerable things or like are tough, you know, tough choices because you answer one way, people go aha, and you answer another way and they go aha. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Braxton. Invite me on your show anytime. You can you can you can actually ask me tough questions. You really want to seek truth. If, like if you really mean it, there's a way to do it. I'll help you. All right. This has been Michael Beverly, and thank you for watching. Please like, share, subscribe, all the good stuff. Until the next one. What are you doing here? I killed the hooker. Can I say something? No!